So in this video I'm going to talk a bit about errors to start with and then I'm going to move on to talk about relationships and how they're shown by graphs. To start off with talking about errors. First of all, what is an error? An error is the difference between a measurement and the true value. So if we've got a battery and we should be measuring a potential difference of 5 volts across it, but our measuring device measures 5.2 for whatever reason. So the error there would be 0.2 volts. So it's the difference between the, what's measured by the measuring device and the actual value it should be reading. There are a couple of types of error you need to know about. So you have systematic error and random error. These are the two types. So systematic error is a type of error which is the same in all measurements taken. So say, for instance, I had a clock and my clock was five minutes fast. Whenever I tried to tell the time, the time I would give would always be five minutes fast. So that's the same error each time. So that's a systematic error. Another time you might come across this is background radiation, which you should have come across in the radiation topic, because this, in theory, should be the same for all the readings so that's a systematic error. A random error is one that affects measurements, but it doesn't affect them in a predictable way. So a classic example of this, like during an investigation, is temperature, because that's not something you can count on as being a constant unless you have a very well-controlled, expensive laboratory in which you can control those sort of things. Typically, that's not something you can control. So those are the two types of error. A few other key words that you need to know when we're talking about errors, something called zero error. And this is when a measuring device gives a non-zero reading where it should be reading zero. So say, for instance, you were measuring the current in a circuit and your circuit was open, so it wasn't fully connected. So in theory, you should be reading zero amps but maybe your measuring device read 1 milliamp or 2 milliamps. That's a zero error. And calibration is the way to try and go about fixing it. So in the example where I talked about the clock earlier, calibration would be when you went and turned the dial on the back of the clock or pushed the buttons if it's a digital clock and set the time back to correctly so then your timings were no longer five minutes fast or when you do a, an experimental measurement with a Geiger counter calculating corrected count rate is a way of calibrating that experiment. Okay so those are the main types of error and there's another specific type of error that I'm going to talk about and that's called parallax error. So this is an error caused by the shifting in the position of the observer so by using something like a ruler or a protractor by moving yourself relative to the measuring device, you can actually change the readings on here. So if we look here, if you're in position A, you would read it here at this point. If you're in position B, you would read it as this point here. And if you're in C, you would read it as this point. Now this is an extremely exaggerated look at this, and in reality, you wouldn't get too much of a difference from shifting it, but it is something to bear in mind. So this example here, where we've got a very straight object very close to the ruler, would have a negligible parallax error. Okay, But there are some times when actually parallax error is not negligible and you need to be aware of it. So the first well, the main area you come up with is the measurement of curved surfaces, because when you have curved surfaces, it exaggerates as parallax error. So say you're trying to measure the diameter of a ball-type object, because if this was a flat circuit, it would be really easy. You'd just plonk the ruler in the middle of it. Say this is a sphere or a ball. You'd actually get considerable parallax area trying to make a judgment, or exactly, oh, where is this edge, where is this edge here? There is considerable framework for introducing a parallax error, and this is one of the examples where you would 
have to be very mindful of that in the when you were recording your results and the precision to which you could claim to record your results. The other example, those of you who do chemistry are very likely to have come across, even though you wouldn't have necessarily known its parallax error, and that's the use of measuring cylinders to measure the volume of liquid. Because due to surface tension on a liquid, you get this meniscus at the top, this curved part here. So your chemistry teacher will always tell you that when you're measuring things with a measuring cylinder, you should get down at eye level, so your, look, your eye is at the level of the meniscus. And the reason for this is to try and reduce parallax error. So by being at this level here, you minimise the parallax error in measuring, and you always measure to the bottom of the meniscus. Again, so you're always staying at the same position relative to the object. So these are examples are um, down at the bottom where parallax is non-negligible. So you need to be mindful of it in when you're quoting like the precision of your instruments and that, that type of thing. So say for instance here normally with this ruler if we say these divisions are one millimeter we would normally say the precision which is the smallest non-zero reading so normally speaking we would say the precision is one millimeter but if we were actually asked you know what is the uncertainty in the readings normally the uncertainty in the reading is equal to the precision so it would be this one here but when we th start thinking about these examples where parallax error has an effect you would actually look at doubling or even tripling this, and like either either of them would be acceptable. And so you would actually say the uncertainty in them is two millimeters or three millimeters. There's no necessarily right answer, but it's about recognizing that you would get increased uncertainty due to this parallax error here. So let's move on and look at some relationships. So the first one is linear and we're going to look at the characteristics of that. So let me draw a few linear graphs here. Okay, so I've drawn lots of different graphs and the key point with all of these graphs is they have a constant gradient. That's what makes something a linear and also once you know something is linear, you can represent it in the form y equals mx plus c. Now you'll notice on this graph that I have not drawn anything that goes through 0, 0. Because if, some, if it's straight line and it does go through 0, 0, you call it something else. You do not call it linear. And you would actually be marked wrong if you wrote that was linear. So let's move on to look at that one. So we've got this one called directly proportional. So let me draw a few directly proportional curves. Okay, what I've actually shown really badly is that these curves should all be going through 0, 0. So these are a, a type of linear curve. So they're always still expressed through y equals mx plus c, but c is equal to zero for directly proportional curves. Well, no, these are going to be lines, I probably shouldn't use the word curves, but it doesn't matter particularly. So for it to be directly proportional, it needs to have a constant gradient, but it also needs to go through zero, zero. So that's what defines something as directly proportional. So let's move on to some other types. We're going to look at a few types of relationship that are not linear, so they're not straight line. So let's draw an example, some examples. Okay, so let's put some labels to them. So we've got a quadratic here and the key point to notice is you have this stationary point here where the gradient is zero and then we've got a cubic type here 
where we've got it coming up in this fashion but instead of like a quadratic going back down again it then bends back on itself and goes like this then we've got an exponential decay here and we've got an exponential increase over here. Okay, so a few key features of an exponential. With exponentials we talk about something called half-life. So, let me rub those out and start that one again. So half-life is the time taken to get half of the original value. So if we say the original value is here, roughly half that is here. So if we dot down to there, if we do another half-life, we're doing approximately half that again. And if we do the same again, And what you find with both exponential decay and exponential increase is that your half-life remains constant. So this point here is at half the original, this one here is at a quarter, this one here will be at an eighth of the original and so on and so on. And you should find this gap here at the bottom, the half-life, stays constant if it's going to be an exponential decay and it will be the same sort of thing if you drew it on an exponential increase type one as well if you do it out the same way I have. Now if you're given one of these in an exam with the AQA exam board there's a couple of things they'll be looking for. So the, one of the keywords they'll be looking for is that you identify is non-linear so that the relationship is non-linear and if you don't have that word you're going to cost yourself a mark because it's important to recognize first of all it's non-linear and then following on for that then you can be more specific and be like oh I found a quadratic or oh I found a cubic one or oh we've got a constant half-life so it's an exponential decay or increase so there's two parts identifying that it's non-linear first of all and then going on to explain in more detail what kind of non-linear type and the ones we looked at before, so the directly proportional and the linear ones, be very careful not to classify a directly proportional relationship as linear. That will get marked wrong. You have to be very precise with your language and say if it goes through 0, 0 and has a constant gradient, it's directly proportional. Or if it has a constant gradient but does not go through 0, 0, then it's linear and you do need to be very precise with that or you'll be throwing away a whole bunch of very easy marks to pick up.